I'm very, very happy to be with you this evening and to try to talk about the significance and the theology of icons, which will contribute, I hope, to the appreciation of the splendid exhibition that is here in the gallery. The story of Christian art begins in the catacombs, vast underground cemeteries that encircle the city of ancient Rome. Here, by the light of torches, Christians buried their dead, recording the name and details of those who were being laid to rest. Among the epitaphs, you will find Christian symbols. More rarely, you will encounter paintings. These early Christians were not self-consciously creating works of art. They were recording a witness to their faith and hope. If we look carefully at these epitaphs and paintings, we will find that they still have much to teach us. The first example, now in the Lateran Museum, is dated to the fourth century, and is thought to have come from the catacomb of St. Callistus or Pritistatus. It reads, Aurelius Castus, who lived eight months, Antonia Sperantia made this for her son. Below is a depiction of a shepherd. He bears a lamb on his shoulders and two sheep recline at his feet. These early Christians expressed their faith instinctively in both text and images. But inscriptions are accessible in a way that imagery is not. Depictions such as this are for the initiate and require explanation. Jesus told a parable about a shepherd who sought out the sheep that had gone astray, and bearing it on his shoulders, he returned it to its place in the fold. He also said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The Galatian Sacramentary, which preserves some of the oldest Latin liturgical prayers, includes a prayer for the burial service that refers to the dead as carried home on the shoulders of the Good Shepherd. Other recurring Christian symbols are the anchor or the dove bearing an olive branch in its beak. On later epitaphs, we find more overt Christian emblems, the Cairo monogram, or the Alpha and Omega. The Catacomb of Comodilla contains an image of Christ dating from the late fourth century. In the Catacomb of St. Priscilla, one finds a depiction of the Virgin Mary dated to the second century. Here also, in the third century, Christians painted the Good Shepherd and doves bearing olive branches. They also painted the three children in the fiery furnace of Babylon, examples of courage and perseverance and reminders of God's protection during times of persecution. The epitaphs of these early Christians reveal much about their faith. We read, To dear Kyriakos, sweetest son, mayest thou live in the Holy Spirit. Regina, mayest thou live in the Lord Jesus. Matronata Matrona, who lived a year and 52 days, pray for thy parents. Anatolius made this for his well-deserving son, who lived seven years, seven months, and 20 days. May thy spirit rest well in God. Pray for thy sister. It has been said that the catacomb inscriptions are ill-composed, ill-written, not infrequently ill-spelt, half Latin, half Greek, and yet neither bad grammar, nor defective orthography, nor rude art, nor cramped space, nor damp, nor darkness, can dim or distort the light with which the consciousness of an immortality floods and glorifies these subterranean vaults. All here is joy and brightness and hope. The often repeated inscription in peace tells its own tale. 
Such inscriptions are popular expressions of the same hope that we find in a theological treatise, De Mortalitate, written by Cyprian of Carthage in the year 252. He reminds his flock that death is not an ending, but a transit, and this journey being traversed, a passage to eternity. The dead are not lost, but sent before. He writes, we regard paradise as our country. We already began to consider the patriarchs as our parents. Why do we not hasten and run that we may behold our country, that we may greet our parents? There a great number of our dear ones is awaiting us, and a dense crowd of parents, brothers, children is longing for us, already assured of their own safety, and still solicitous for our salvation. In this spontaneous expression of their faith through words and images, had Christians gone too far? The Roman world was filled with paintings and statues of the pagan deities. The Jews had always been careful to distance themselves from this idolatry. There were those who felt that such Christian depictions were an unguarded appropriation from the pagan world. Eusebius of Caesarea in the fourth century church history relates that the woman with an issue of blood who was healed by Christ made a bronze statue to commemorate this miracle. Christ was depicted standing and blessing her while she was portrayed kneeling and looking up to him in gratitude. Eusebius writes that he has seen this statue for himself. Yet we cannot miss the note of criticism in his voice as he goes on to write, nor is it strange that those of the Gentiles who of all were benefited by our Savior should have done such things, since we have learned also that the likenesses of his apostles Paul and Peter and of Christ himself are preserved in paintings, the ancients being accustomed, as is it is likely, according to a habit of the Gentiles, to pay this kind of honor indiscriminately to those regarded by them as deliverers. One would want to know what these fourth century paintings of Christ and of the apostles Paul and Peter look like, but paintings are fragile, and in general they have not survived from the world of late antiquity. The exception to this is Sinai, this remote monastery with its dry and stable climate and an unbroken history extending back to the early fourth century, holds what is today the most important collection of panel icons, 36 of which have been dated to the sixth or seventh century. The icon of the Sinai Christ is the most famous. It was painted in the wax encaustic technique, which uses wax as the medium for the colors. The gold halo is set off by alternating four and eight petal punched rosettes. Christ's mantle and tunic were rendered in a saturated purple. He blesses with his right hand. In his left, he holds the gospel, a thick volume closed with two clasps. The cover is adorned with a cross executed in precious stones and decorated with pearls. The formal frontal depiction of Christ conveys a sense of timelessness. Yet the many intentional departures from strict symmetry add a naturalistic effect. In this subtle manner, the artist has attempted to convey both the divine and human natures of Christ. The second icon depicts the Virgin Mary and the Christ child enthroned. Here also, Christ blesses with his right hand while with his left he holds a scroll. The Virgin Mary wears red shoes, an imperial prerogative, and holds Christ tenderly. She gazes off into the distance. A soldier saint stands to either side, wearing the ceremonial robes of the imperial guard. These are identified by later iconographic types as St. George to the viewer's right and St. Theodore to the viewer's left. Above, two archangels holding scepters look up towards heaven. The hand of God extends from an orb 
and a ray of light descends to the halo of the Holy Virgin. The two archangels, rendered in a continuation of the Hellenistic tradition, contrast with the enthroned virgin and Christ child and two soldier saints, which reflect the splendors of the imperial court and give the icon a complexity and richness. The third icon shows the apostle Peter. In his right hand, he holds three keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In his left, he holds a staff surmounted by the cross. The artist has painted the garment of the apostle in shades of olive using crisscrossing highlights rendered in bold brushstrokes. The gaze of the viewer is drawn to the calm and pensive eyes, the face set off by whirling tufts of hair and beard. The apostle has the face of the sunburned fisherman, but he also has the aristocratic demeanor of the leader of the church. The three medallions above depict Christ in the center. Kurt Weitzman identified the other two as depictions of the Virgin Mary and St. John the Theologian, though it has been recently suggested that they may be instead ex voto images included as an expression of thanksgiving by those who commissioned the icon. All three icons are thought to have been painted in Constantinople and may have been sent to the monastery in the sixth century as gifts of imperial patronage when the Emperor Justinian ordered the construction of the great basilica and the surrounding fortress walls. As such, they are examples of the icons that would have been in Constantinople at the outbreak of iconoclasm, which the Emperor Leo III, the Osarian, began to institute in the year 726. There were two phases to iconoclasm. The first came to an end under the Empress Irene in 787. An iconoclastic policy was instituted again in 815 by the Emperor Leo V, the Armenian. The second phase was brought to an end in 843 by the Empress Theodora. The origins of iconoclasm have been much debated. The seventh century was very much an age of transition for the Byzantine Empire. It was a culmination of a long process of centralization by which Constantinople emerged as the dominant center of power. In the same century, the empire lost Syria, Egypt, and North Africa to the Arab world, while Slavs threatened its hold in the Balkans and the Lombards became more assertive in Italy. Arab forces attacked Constantinople itself in 674 to 678. And again in 717 to 718, the Greeks famously defending their city with Greek fire. All of these far-reaching changes and conflicts caused a reassessment of the Byzantine polity. This brought into the open issues concerning the place of Christian imagery that had remained unresolved. One must look to these conflicts for the origins of iconoclasm more than to any infiltration of the church and the empire by alien ideas. God commanded Moses, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. The central charge brought by the iconoclasts again and again is that of idolatry. Any image that has been created for use in worship draws attention to the visible material creature rather than the invisible deity. St. Paul, in his epistle to the Colossians, refers to Christ as the image, the icon, of the invisible God. In the language of the creed, Christ is one in essence, homoousios, consubstantial with the Father. For the iconoclast, in order for an image to be true, it must be the same in essence as that which it represents. There must be a formal identity between a model and its archetype. 
A portrayal differs in its very nature from that which it represents and is therefore insufficient if not deceptive. Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Created images could not be allowed to intrude in worship which must remain entirely spiritual. In a number of churches, iconoclasts removed icons of Christ and replaced them with a depiction of the cross. The cross, being a symbol, did not detract from the worship that is due to God alone. St. Stephen the New was insistent in his veneration of the icons. He was brought before the Emperor Constantine V, who asked him, Do you imagine that Christ is trampled upon when we trample upon these images? St. Stephen had expected this and had brought with him a coin. He showed it to the emperor and asked, Who is this, this image and superscription? It is mine, answered the emperor. The saint placed it on the ground and trampled on it. The emperor's guards were outraged and ready to avenge this affront to the imperial dignity. But the emperor called them off. The saint had made his point. And yet, while everyone knew that there had been icons in the church for centuries, in many ways they had been taken for granted. There were passing references to them in the writings of the fathers, but there was no formal theology of the icons. What could be said in their defense? Those who reverenced the icons pointed out that God had indeed forbidden the making of graven images, but at the same time he had commanded Moses, and thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, and the two ends of the mercy seat. The second commandment was thus not a prohibition against representational art, but it was a prohibition against attempting to betray the deity, for God had revealed himself, but not in any form. Moses said to the children of Israel, For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. But in the fullness of time, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God, who was uncircumscribable, condescended to be circumscribed by time and place. And he who was indepictable thereby became depictable. St. Theodore the Studite wrote that in Christ, the divine nature and the human nature were united into a single prosopon, a single person, and a single hypostasis, a single subsistent entity, which has individual characteristics and can be portrayed. And St. John of Damascus wrote, I do not venerate the creation instead of the creator, but I venerate the creator, created for my sake, who came down to his creation without being lord or weakened, that he might glorify my nature and bring about communion with the divine nature. I do not depict the indivisible div divinity, but I depict God made visible in the flesh. Icons are a witness to the historical Christ. A refusal to accept icons was a refusal to accept the full implications of the Incarnation. Courts of Roman law had an image of the emperor, and this image was honored as if the emperor himself were present. Basil the Great in the fourth century pointed out that this does not mean there are two emperors because the honor offered to the image crosses over to the archetype. An image conveys the likeness of the original person. Image and archetype are thus said to share the same likeness. St. Dionysius the Arapagite, in his ecclesiastical hierarchy, had written, For the truth is shown in the likeness, the archetype in the icon, each in the other with a difference of essence. This was quoted by Patriarch Nikephoros of Constantinople in the early 9th century, who himself wrote, Likeness is an intermediate relation and mediates between the extremes. I mean, the likeness and the one of whom it is a likeness 
uniting and connecting by form, even though they differ by nature. And yet, a traditional icon was not a simple portrait. The likenesses conveyed in icons were those of Christ or the saints who live in heaven. Here, St. John appealed to the example of the tabernacle that had been constructed for the worship of God in the Sinai wilderness. God said to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I shew thee. After the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. The tabernacle on earth shared the likeness with the tabernacle in heaven that had been revealed to Moses. Because of this correspondence, the ministry of the priests within the tabernacle was unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as we read in the epistle to the Hebrews. St. John of Damascus invokes all of these associations when he writes, and this whole tabernacle was an icon. And look, said the Lord to Moses, that thou make everything after their pattern, which was shewed unto thee in the mount. The tabernacle is called an icon, in that it is a reflection of the heavenly prototype. Icons of Christ and the saints are also reflections, each corresponding to an archetype in heaven. As St. Theodore the Studite wrote, the copy shares the glory of its prototype as a reflection shares the brightness of the light. The Holy Apostle Paul had written of the soul beholding the glory of God as in a mirror. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Ancient mirrors were made of burnished brass or other metals. They had to be polished frequently to prevent the surface from being obscured by tarnish or corrosion. We will not fully appreciate these references to a mirror unless we know how mirrors were understood in the Greek world. Plato in the Timaeus explains that mirror images are formed when the light from the eye meets the light from what is seen on the surface of the mirror. And these two sets of rays of light mingle there to form the image. Thus, mirror images actually exist. The mirror, when it is clear, accurately conveys the image that is seen, even as a soul, when it has been purified, becomes like a mirror reflecting the glory of God. It is changed into a real image of God, though God and his image remain distinct according to nature. Philo had written of the mind looking on truth as at a mirror, and Plotinus of the soul recovering its former beauty through spiritual cleansing. Theophilus of Antioch in the second century had written, as a British mirror, so ought man to have his soul pure. When there is rust on the mirror, it is not possible that a man's face be seen in the mirror. So also, when there is sin in a man, such a man cannot behold God. And Clement of Alexandria had written in the third century, for it is thus that one truly follows the Savior by aiming at sinlessness and at his perfection, in adorning and composing the soul before it as a mirror, and arranging everything in all respects similarly. But it remained to Athanasius of Alexandria to take these metaphors and develop them in a way that was firmly grounded in Nicene Orthodoxy. In his work against the heathen, he writes of the soul being a mirror in which it can see the image of the Father. And later in the same treatise, he writes, for the soul was made according to God's image and created according to his likeness, as the divine scripture shows when it says in the person of God, 
Let us make man according to our image and according to our likeness. For this reason, when the soul puts off from itself every stain of sin with which it is covered and keeps pure only what is according to the image, then naturally, when this becomes bright, it beholds an, as in a mirror the image of the Father, the Word, and in him considers the Father, of whom the Savior is the image. Subsequent spiritual writers continue to use this metaphor to describe the soul's resemblance to God. Philotheus of Sinai is known to us only from his work, 40 Texts on Watchfulness. He lived in perhaps the ninth or 10th century. He writes, at every hour and moment, let us guard the heart with all diligence from thoughts that obscure the soul's mirror. For in that mirror, Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God the Father, is typified and luminously reflected. In the first chapter of Genesis, we read, And God said, Let us make man according to our image and according to our likeness. And yet, in the following verse, we read, So God created man, according to the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. There is no mention of likeness in the second verse. The distinction that is implied in the scriptures between image and likeness is explained by St. Gregory of Nyssa. We possess the one by creation. We acquire the other by free will. In the first structure, it is given to us to be born in the image of God. By free will, there is formed in us the being and the likeness of God. In St. Viadokos of Fotiki, a fifth century ascetic saint has written, all men are made in God's image, but to be in his likeness is granted only to those who through great love have brought their own freedom into subjection to God. For only when we do not belong to ourselves do we become like him who through love has reconciled us to himself. No one achieves this unless he persuades his soul not to be distracted by the false glitter of this life. There have been many attempts to explain how it is that man is created in the image of God. Sometimes this is sought in the sovereign dignity of man, sometimes in his spiritual nature, in the soul, in the mind, in the higher faculties such as the intellect, the reason, or the freedom that is proper to man. But according to St. Gregory of Nyssa, the image of God in man in so far as is it is perfect, is necessarily unknowable, for as it reflects the fullness of its archetype, it must also possess the unknowable character of the divine being. This is the reason why it is impossible to define what constitutes the divine image in man. We can only conceive it through the idea of participation in the infinite goodness of God. And St. Maximus the Confessor has written, the human person unites their created nature with the uncreated through love. Oh, the wonder of God's love for us human beings, showing them to be one and the same through the possession of grace. The whole creation, wholly interpenetrated by God and become completely whatever God is, save at the level of being. There is an ontological gulf between God and man. The soul is not connateral with God. But this gulf has been bridged by the Incarnation. The Creator came down to his creation without being lowered or weakened, that he might glorify my nature and bring about communion with the divine nature. St. John of Damascus wrote this in his defense of the veneration of holy icons, for icons are a witness to the incarnation. 
where iconoclasts had created a dualism, depreciating the material world in their reverence for the spiritual, those who venerated the icons pointed to a material world sanctified by the incarnation and the means of our ascent to the spiritual. We read in St. John of Damascus, for since we are twofold, fashion of soul and body, and our soul is not naked, but as it were covered by a mantle, it is impossible for us to reach what is intelligible apart from what is bodily. And St. Theodore wrote, so whether in an image or in the gospel or in the cross or in any other consecrated object, there God is manifestly worshiped in spirit and in truth as the materials are exalted by the raising of the mind towards God. The mind does not remain with the materials because it does not trust in them. That is the error of the idolaters. Through the materials, rather, the mind ascends towards the prototype. This is the faith of the Orthodox. Concerning the veneration of saints, St. John of Damascus writes, the saints are the sons of God, sons of the kingdom, the co-heirs of God and of Christ. Therefore, I venerate the saints and glorify them, slaves and friends and the co-heirs of Christ, slaves by nature, friends by choice, sons and heirs by divine grace. He also said, from the time when he that is himself life and the author of life was numbered among the dead, we do not call dead those who have fallen asleep in hope of the resurrection and faith in him. St. John of Damascus justified the place of icons in Christian worship and veneration. In his writings, we also find the same consciousness of an immortality that was so pronounced in the epitaphs from the Roman catacombs. It is not only the imagery that has continued from those early centuries, but the faith and hope as well that placed the images and epitaphs in the Roman catacombs long ago. In our own days, we are witnessing a revival of interest in traditional iconography. The Sinai icons especially are being studied minutely <coughs> not only to assess their place in the history of art, but to understand and recover, if possible, the techniques by which they were created. If you have as yet had the courage to try to paint icons using wax and caustic media, yet the Sinai icons of the Macedonian and Comnenian dynasties are being increasingly appreciated, that is, the classicizing art that flourished after the end of iconoclasm from the 10th through the 12th centuries. These icons have long been admired by art historians. Iconographers are only now beginning to recover the masterful and seemingly effortless techniques of the art of this period, plunging into what one iconographer referred to as the ocean of Comnenian iconography. These artists seem to have gone beyond simple egg tempera, creating sophisticated glazes using perhaps an egg oil emulsion. All such efforts have as their goal not the recovery of earlier techniques only, but to create anew icons of artistic and spiritual presence that will lift up our minds and hearts in spiritual inspiration reminding us yet again that icons are reflections of the glory of heaven and paradigms of what we also are called to be, polished reflections of Christ, who is himself the icon of the invisible God. Thank you.